And I started to, with this grief, be broken open to my feelings and to my heart intelligence and to the ways in which my heart has been stuck or tense or angry or resentful or whatever it is that I never could fully grasp, even in my studies, even in my therapy, even in, because I had a psychologist, a psychiatrist, like all these things, I just, it seemed very almost business oriented. Whereas when I broke open, I was like, this is an experience. You have to experience something to heal too. You have to experience the feelings, not just ruminate over and over in your thoughts, because that won't heal you. That won't help you. You could logicalize everything you want, but until you actually drop down in and you grieve and you cry and you scream, I just started to allow myself to be human and not to compartmentalize the things. Have you been through something so life-altering that your passion is now to live as authentic and true to yourself as possible? If so, you are going to love this week's guest on the beautiful side of grief, Sydney Decker, who, by honoring her own mind, body, and spirit, hopes to inspire others to do so as well. Sydney had been experiencing depression, anxiety, agoraphobia, and also turbulent thoughts similar to her dad before he tragically took his own life when she was just 20 years old. It was this event that became the catalyst for unbelievable and heartwarming change in her life. Yet, it wasn't an easy path. You see, Sydney, like all of us, had to first come to terms with her shadow self, the parts we like to keep hidden even from ourselves, our inner demons. Let's see where Sydney's grief journey led her and how she's discovered the beauty within out of the darkness she experienced, which has ultimately led her from her psychology degree to becoming a well-respected Ayurveda health counsellor and intuitive healer with her own healing business, Inner Element Wellness. A very warm welcome to you, Sydney. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honoured to be a guest on this podcast. It's great to have you. And I think we're going to explore some things that I haven't explored previous with other guests. So I'm very excited about that. And that fun journey you've been on, essentially being in a very, very scary place as a teen to now healing others. So we're going to explore that. But first, I would like to hear about a favorite memory you have of your dad. Oh, wow. So my favorite memory, I mean, I have many. As soon as you asked that, that started popping up. So two come up. One is when me and my brother were little. My dad was very present and very a very passionate father and loved to play and make sure that we enjoyed playing. So he used to get down and he, it's funny because we used to call him the monster, but it was so much fun. He would get down on all fours and act like this little monster and chase after us, but then would get us and start tickling us and all these things. And when I think back on that, I just, we used to love that. That was like a very fun memory and just popped up. I totally forgot about it until you (laughs) asked that question. And then I would say that honestly, my favorite memory was... Probably a few weeks before he passed, we were in the car and I found this old song to me. It was old and it was called Send Me on My Way by Rusted Root. And I used to just sing it and I loved it. And I was showing my dad the song and he was like, this is one of my favorite songs. And I had no idea. And so me and my dad, we were on our way to dinner, just me and him. Sometimes we would go for like dinner and a movie just for fun. and we sang that song together and it was like one of my favorite memories because we were just like in unison dancing singing to this song and to this day I've actually decided that I'm not if I do get married I'm not going to walk down the aisle to the traditional song I'm going to walk down the aisle to that song because it's like send me on my way so it was like a very powerful moment that when I look back it's become one of my favorite memories because we were like 
really in tune. We were singing, we were dancing, and he was heavy for a while and like kind of dark and I could see his light come through in that time. And so that's something that I hold very close and dear to my heart. So whenever that song comes on, I'll hear it. And like whenever I feel really dark or down, like it'll just come on the radio randomly or my playlist. And so it just really makes me feel connected to him and like we're in tune and in touch still. So that's probably my favorite memory. Oh my gosh, that is so cool. And I just understand that power of listening to a song and instantly connecting you with someone. For me, everybody knows it's Harry Styles, sign of the times. <laughs> my daughter, every time I hopped in the car after she died, she would play that. And it was just like, she's just saying, stop crying, mama. It's meant to be. And it always lifts me when I hear of that. It's mm -hmm. just such a strong memory. And that I love that because it was a couple of weeks before he passed. And so it was almost like he was consciously or subconsciously creating that beautiful connection with you. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, right. There's definitely something ordained in there. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. So you just mentioned it slightly, but were you aware in your teens that he was facing his own mental health struggles as deep as he was? So I think at the time I was so clouded by my own that I didn't realize how I was probably picking up a lot on his stuff because me and him were very in tune since I was a little kid. And I don't know if you know anything about human design. Yes. You've heard about it. Okay. So I'm a projector. So I started to learn this later on. In the, and actually, I've started to really learn it in the last few years since 2020. And I started to apply it to my life and it started to make a lot of sense to me that I was so in tune and so plugged in to his subconscious and to his energy as a projector. And so I think I took on a lot of his darkness. And I actually remember saying at one point, I think I was like nine years old, that to like to the universe, I, I could tell he was struggling because he was he struggled with alcoholism. And he was like, as a kid, I was very OCD hyper fixated on his problems with drinking and I would count the beer cans and tell my mom how many beer cans he had last night and I just was very like in tune and I remember even saying to the universe at one point give me some of that darkness so he doesn't have it and so I could start to take some of that away from him because I as a child I was very in tune but I think when I said that worked <laughs> and because I started to have a lot of as I moved into my teenage years a lot of suicidal thoughts and ideations and just really intense feelings about myself and the world and just feeling very isolated and depressed and anxious. But at the time, I would say around fifth grade, so I think, what are you, like 12, 13, like sixth grade, my dad moved across the state, all the states, to Arizona. So I'm in Pennsylvania. I grew up in Pennsylvania and he moved to Arizona. And so he was trying to distance himself. So at that time, I got way more caught up in my own darkness and my own feelings that I didn't necessarily realize maybe what he was going through at the time. But I do remember noticing this shift and the change in my childhood because, like I said, one of the memories when you asked was when he was very present and he was like, Christmases were always good and all these things. And then he actually lost his mom. And I started to see that really take a toll on him. And then as I, about seven, his drinking really got intense and set in. And then nine, I asked the universe to let me take some of that on. And then up until literally he took his own life, I was suicidal as well. Were you aware at nine years old? Just what you were asking for, that's pretty, pretty heavy to take on somebody else's hurt and pain and struggles at nine years old. And I think it was probably already coded in your DNA and you, you probably just switched it on majorly, do you think? And also being around it as well, that was just like just waiting to happen, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Looking back at everything, it all makes sense especially knowing what I do now and where the universe has taken me and me being a healer 
and stepping forth into that, especially after losing my dad and first starting with healing myself and then expanding that to helping other people to heal. But I think at the time I didn't really understand what I was saying or what I was Mm. asking for, but I still believe that it was meant to happen and it was meant to be said because it taught me so much about shadow work and darkness and it really taught me how to start to set boundaries now that I am older and after I've started to realize that I didn't just do that for my dad. I've done that for many people throughout my life, just like intuitively taking things on because I didn't want them to suffer or struggle, but also noticing that that puts me right in the ditch with them. So I can't necessarily help them if I'm sitting right next to them. I can, that's helping me understand their experience, but it's not, it lowers me and then it makes me fall off track and I have to start to basically alchemize that darkness, which has been taking me years to recognize how I do that. Yeah, I believe that if someone were to ask me if I would do that again, I think I probably would knowing what it has taught me, but I wouldn't recommend anyone else doing that. But as far as like my journey goes, I think that was part of what needed to be done for me. My soul journey. I agree with you. I look at my own past and I just see, oh my gosh, it's got been through every possible thing you could imagine. But each one, you know, once I realized that it was for my growth and not to hurt me, you know, it was happening for me, not to me. Once I finally hooked into that, that's when, you know, it majorly started shifting. So I understand what you're talking about. But you also mentioned that you feel that the depth of your dad was destined. Talk to us about that. So it's a very interesting thing that I can say now. So like looking back on it, Mm because I even was talking to my mom and my aunt. And then I actually have a podcast of my own. So I just revisited this on our podcast that we talked on. And so I'm just kind of throwing this in there right now because it's going to help me answer the question. But I recently unexpectedly sure. lost my uncle during Christmas and his son was the age that I was when I lost my dad. And so I was able to really put myself in his shoes and show up for him the way that I needed someone to show up for me. And so I started to actually look at everything that's taken place in my life since my dad has passed, which this is why I love your podcast because it's the beautiful side of grief. Because how many people can I sit and say this to that it won't sound outrageous? But I started to realize that if my dad had not passed the way that he did at the time that he did in the way that he did in my life and where it was at, I wouldn't be who I am today. And so if you would have asked me if I would change what has taken place, At this moment in time, I don't think I would. I don't think that I would have changed anything because it's given me a gift of finding myself. And sometimes we have to hit that rock bottom and that deep darkness for our light to burst open and expand. And so to answer your question, I feel like It was either going to be, I feel like there's a soul contract. So I feel like I can talk about that, right? So it was, yeah, yeah. I feel like there was like a soul contract because it was either going to be him or me because we struggled with that same darkness. And I think he knew that it had to be him because the next in the evolutionary, the DNA. So it could have been me. But I don't, I think where he was at, even in his letter that he wrote to me, because with the alcoholism and struggling, his brain wasn't working anymore. And I don't know if he would have been able to come through into the light in which he knew and trusted that I could. And so I think that we came into this lifetime knowing that something was going to happen. And the funny thing about it is when I was a child, I used to picture my wedding day and I could see everyone else at my wedding. But I could never, ever picture my dad there, ever. And I would like really try, really focus and really push myself 
to try to force to see him there. And I never could. And I would do this when I was very little. And I would always ask myself, I wonder why I can't see my dad there. And I would just have this like weird feeling, but then I would like let it go. And then I would come back to try to like see my wedding again. And I could see my mom and my brother and my aunt. And but I could never, ever see my dad. And even with the father daughter dance, I could never like fully envision it. So I think that I always knew. And maybe that's why I became so plugged in to his darkness. And me and him were the I was the closest to him until he passed, too. I I lived with him for a while. I was like always checking in on him, calling him. I just always knew that something probably was going to take place subconsciously. And that I would act out in different ways consciously around it. So definitely a soul contract. And I believe that we decided before we came here what was going to take place. So I don't know whether you're aware or not, but I, even before I had my daughter, I used to have these bizarre reactions to teenagers dying in car accidents. And I would never know why it troubled me so much, why it disturbed me, why I was so like, I used to just think, I cannot possibly imagine how a parent would feel to lose their teenager in a car accident. Now, of course, that's how my daughter died, wasn't it? And it, when she died in a car accident, I mean, oh my gosh. So on some level, I knew this was going to happen. And that's why I had those strange reactions to it. But like what you've just said, if it wasn't you, you know, it was going to be your dad and you just knew on a deeper level. And of course, where you've taken this, I mean, you've just set your life up to be able to help and heal others. So let's talk about that now, because that was a life-changing, defining moment for you when your dad took his life and you decided to get into psychology. I was in college studying psychology before my dad passed. I was actually about to finish up my finals in my last year. And so I, my mom actually got me interested in psychology because she was a counselor. So I was very drawn to that, but I was very drawn to like the darkest part of psychology, which is forensic psychology. So kind of like understanding that dark which is, mm-hmm. makes a lot of sense even more now because I took that dark psychology, Carl Jung, and now I do like shadow work inner child healing with it. So it's, I was always preparing myself to understand what I needed to do when I got to this place in my life. So I started to study it because I wanted to first and foremost make sense of my own brain because my brain would attack me. Like it would just be this, these dark thoughts, this heaviness, these anxiety attacks. And I did also want to understand what drove someone to drink it and what drove someone to addiction and that type of stuff too, because that runs in my family. So I was really just trying to make sense of my world and my life. And I was home on break when, actually it was like Easter break, I was home when my dad ended up taking his life. So before I was already involved in psychology, but after he passed and took his life and I graduated, I realized that, because I've been in therapy since I was 12. I've been really like doing my own journaling, doing all these things, but for some reason I wasn't always getting the, My brain would feel better after talking, I guess I'll say, but I wasn't feeling any better inside, if that makes sense. It's I would feel like, okay, I just Mm -hmm. got that out, but I wouldn't, nothing would last. And so in my grief, I've never been broken open the way that I was in my whole entire life. And I think that's a gift sometimes when grief comes and it breaks you open, you start to realize like all the darkness and everything that was trapped, like your heart just opens. And I remember just like dropping and crying out and realizing like, there's something different here. Like I'm different all of a sudden, like my heart is broken open. I'm feeling all these things that I never really felt because for so long I was trying to heal just my brain, like just through the mental body, just through the talk therapy. And so this moment really brought me to like broke breaking open. And so that's when I realized there's more to healing than just healing my brain. 
and just healing my thoughts. There's something in my heart. My heart has an intelligence. I started to realize the feelings that I was feeling. My brain can't feel anything. My brain can think things, but my brain isn't feeling. I'm feeling. And I started to, with this grief, be broken open to my feelings and to my heart intelligence and to the ways in which my heart has been stuck or tense or angry or resentful or whatever it is that I never could fully grasp, even in my studies even in my therapy, even in, because I had a psychologist, a psychiatrist, like all these things, I just, it seemed very almost business oriented. Whereas like when I broke open, I was like, this is an experience. You have to experience something to heal too. You have to experience the feelings, not just ruminate over and over in your thoughts, because that won't heal you. That won't help you. It just, You could logicalize everything you want, but until you actually drop down in and you grieve and you cry and you scream and you break, I literally break pencils or scream in a pillow or run out in the middle of the forest and drop to my knees. I just started to allow myself to be human and not to compartmentalize the things, the healing, the way that I was taught to heal my brain. I hope I'm answering your question. But losing my dad helped me to realize I need to heal myself. And that healing myself is because he was doing psychiatrists. He was getting acupuncture. He was trying to do things and find his way through spirituality. It just didn't click because he was doing it a lot up in his brain. He was trying. He was so fixated on his brain. And if you really think about it, that's what bothered him the most because that's how he died. It really taught me that I need to take the healing from where he ended, because he took me and he brought me to that spiritual place. He gave me the books. He told me who to read. He told me where to go, but he could only go so far with it. So I had to take that light that he could pass along and deepen it internally in my own experience. So that way I could really heal it. So I wouldn't pass it down. So that's where I took it into my heart. So my heart broke open, but for the first time in my life, I decided that that's where I wanted to stay. It broke me open to realize and see a lot of things about myself. And it's kind of like that really huge, because I started, I've always been spiritual ever since I was a child. Like I've seen angels, I've seen things, I've had prophetic dreams. I have this light, like I was just very loving, very kind, very caring. And then at nine, like I said, I took on that darkness and then I started to close down. So it broke me open to my truth again. And that's when I knew that, okay, I'm on a journey and I have a mission. And now it's my turn to take this baton and see what I can do with it because he's passed it down and he's passed it on. That's where I decided to take it more into learning Ayurveda. So I got a job out of college right after he passed. I was think I was like six months after he passed and then I graduated and I was working with children with autism. And that was rewarding in a sense, but it also, a lot of people know, doesn't pay very well because it's after school and it's like very lim- limited hours and stuff. So I started to ask the universe. I started talking to the universe <laughs> And I started to ask, what do I need to do? I need something else. I want supplemental income. I had just gone on this magical journey down to Florida and stayed with my aunt for a month and just was like, we were guided. We having all these signs and these synchronicities and these experiences. And when I came back, I wanted to carry that along. So I was like, how can I continue to bring this into my life? So where do I go? What do I do here? So that's when I saw that the Ayurveda Center, I've never even heard of Ayurveda. I never even knew what it was. I saw that they were hiring for bodywork technicians and I read about it and immediately I had chills, which is always my sign of go do this. So, and I had just, now that I'm thinking too, I had just had a reading with one of my favorite spiritual counselors and she had told me that one day I, it would be really great for me to have my own healing business. And I was like, no way. That's never going to happen. That's so fun <laughs> saying that. Not even realizing that the universe was preparing me. So I applied to the Ayurveda Center. I started working there and I just started to see people getting better by body work. 
by self-care, by herbs, by taking time for stillness and silence, by putting oils on their body and changing their diet and just really getting more in tune with who they are and their internal elements. And so when that took place, I was like, even had another awakening and I decided to study and to go through with becoming an Airbnb health counselor. First and foremost, because I was like, I need to do this for myself. I need to change something for me. So that way I can continue to be in this world and show up because I, for the first time too, I could see what suicide did on the other side. For the longest time, I was the person who wanted to commit the suicide. And then this took that away from me in the best way possible. I mean that because then I got to experience what my mom went through, what my brother was going through, what my dad's side of the family was going through, what I was experiencing losing him. And it made me realize I can't do that to them. I can't do that to my mom, too, because me and my mom have a very close relationship. So how can I want to be here? How can I want to feel good and be here? So I started practicing Ayurveda and that has just led me even deeper on my journey into doing child healing work, into starting my own business, which I've been in practice since 2017 now. It's sad because I miss my dad. You know what I'm saying? I love him. And I was even just thinking about how great it would be to see him and hug him. But I feel like that day that he passed opened a doorway for me to step forth into. And I'm so glad that I did because I wouldn't be who I am if I had chosen to stay stuck or to stay in the darkness or to not heal it. And I think that's what that beautiful side of grief is. If you walk through it, if you go through it, if you welcome it and you allow it to change you, it can also heal you and it can bring you closer to your purpose. And so I really wanted to do right by my dad in that way, by finding that purpose. And then ultimately, it was really just for myself. So I hope that answers your question. Wow, there is so much that you've just said that we could just go down to yeah. rabbit holes with because it is, look, whatever you provide to us as listeners is perfect because I believe in the value of what you're saying and speaking from that firsthand experience of being in that situation and then being able to be the observer of what was happening. And I know how powerful that must be now for you helping others to see both sides of the coin and why you needed to experience that. There's a flip side to all this pain and heartache as well, because you also found gratitude and meditation very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want to just share with us how that has impacted your life? Yes. Interestingly enough, a year before my dad took his own life, I tried to take my own life. And I think that I was so in tune with my dad now looking back on things that as soon as he made that choice, I started to make that. That's how I could tell it was either me or him. And so there was an intense experience while I was in college and I just, I tried to take my own life and I was in the hospital for a while. And I had this dream where I was talking to this counselor and we were talking about my life and I was starting to like laugh and to smile and to feel gratitude because this counselor was helping me to see all the good things in my life that I wasn't able to see before. And so I remember saying to the counselor in my dream, like, I want to, I'm ready to live. I want to live. And so the counselor was like, okay, I'm going to go get you water. And then I woke up and I was in my hospital room. So I wasn't actually ever talking to anyone. And so my mom, I was like, where'd the counselor guy go? And my mom said, no, there's never been a counselor. It's just been me and you've been asleep for hours. And then I fell back asleep and was healing and all these things. But when I finally got to a positive place, I remembered that feeling of gratitude, basically. And this is why everything to me is ordained and everything just is like a journey because I was starting to feel better and I was walking around campus again and I went into the bookstore 
on campus. And on the, in the bookstore on campus, I saw this book called The Magic. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. I've heard of The Secret. And it was like based on The Secret. It's called The Magic. And so I pulled it out. I started like reading it there. And I was like, I need to get this immediately because it was all about the journey of gratitude. It's like a 28 day journey and she guides you through it and all these things. And so I followed that book religiously. There's meditations in there. There's practices in there. And at the end of it, I was way, I was like a different person. I felt so much joy in, in my life that I never felt before. Not to say that I'm anywhere, because now I find a lot of joy. It was like back then I actually could find joy when before I could not find any joy is what I mean. I started to find joy Mm -hmm. and I started to find gratitude. And one of the biggest things in there that really shifted things for me was it's like one of the last exercises in the book it's like you every step you take you say thank you so be it's like this walking meditation but it's a gratitude meditation and that honestly changed like my life I don't even know how or why or exactly what it is but that act of every step and saying thank you and then you take a breath and then you take another step and you say thank you just like really grounded me down into the earth and grounded me into my experience and grounded me into my life and then I started to see that I became more lighter and I felt lighter and my heart was able to receive some things that it wasn't able to see because when you are in such a dark place and your mind is against you, you are, that creates an energy and that energy will then attract, because this is what I learned in Ayurveda, like attracts like. So if you're complaining all the time, the universe is going to give you more things to complain about because that's the energy in which you're focused on and that's the energy in which you're inviting into your life. Whether it feels good or not, on some level, you are actually inviting it to you. I started to finally see that difference because I was so dark and I would always just kind of like complain or have these bad things happen that it continued to create things to complain about and similar experiences. So I, this gratitude and this meditation created like a space. So it wasn't just like one bad thing after another, one thought after bad thought after another. It created this like space of light. And then I sat with that light and I was like, oh, something different. I can do something different. So then I started to walk down a different path, literally in my brain. I could start to see that new neuro net pathway almost when I started doing that walking meditation with gratitude. And so once I started doing that, I used to tell myself I had no friends, blah, blah, blah. No one liked me. All of a sudden, I was getting invited to things because I was like receiving and people were starting to see me differently because I was starting to feel different, which was allowing a different type of energy to enter into my life and me to engage with. So I actually started to create like all of a sudden I had friends because I had just transferred into the new school and all these things. So I started to like, more positive experiences started to happen to me with doing the practice of gratitude. And so I actually started to realize that gratitude is a magic superpower that I have for the last 10 years continued to utilize in my life. And sometimes I'll fall off, but then I'll immediately get back to it and things start working out for me again. And it's it literally is just being thankful and holding that feeling in my body and allowing my heart to be open to receiving it, that has changed and shifted so much. And so I've started to bring that into my work with my clients, helping them to find things to be grateful for. And I've even created like a free five-day mini gratitude course on my website. So that way, that's my gift to the world because gratitude was a gift to me. And so I don't charge for my little five-day course because that's just gratitude. I'm giving gratitude for gratitude. So that way people can start to realize that power and that influence. Once you start to get in tune with being thankful and grateful, even for the negative, horrible things, they shift and they change too. And gratitude, if anything, if you take away anything from what I say, is to start to practice gratitude because it's literally the tool that I return back to over and over and over. And it's the tool that consistently works over and over again. 
Everything you've just said resonates with me because I also find there's powerful, powerful tools, life-changing tools that I've ever, I, I kind of knew about it and, you know, I've heard it, you know, oh yeah, gratitude, I'm grateful. But when you actually really start to just focus on that and feel it, like when you were speaking, I could feel that in my heart. I could feel my heart responding to what you were saying because it connected. No, it's light. Um, I could really, really feel that. And it's magical. It's magical because it's so easy to do. It's almost too easy because it's easy not to do. Exactly. <laughs> but oh, if the, you do nothing else in your grief, just practice that one thing and see what it does for you and see how it changes you. Like you were talking earlier, you're saying we tend to focus on what our mind is telling us, what our mind is doing, but really it's about our bodies, isn't it? What our bodies are feeling, how they're responding, because they're the true indicator of how we feel about ourselves, how we feel about others, how open we are, how closed off we are. Mm -hmm. Are you feeling lost, anxious, unsure of how to navigate the loss of your beautiful loved one? Don't know where to head next? Yeah, I get that. Then you may be interested in the offering I've developed, a letter of hope and aroha, to help you find out who you are right here and now and how you can navigate that without being on that emotional roller coaster, feeling out of control. That's a feeling I really disliked after Tal and then Adrian died. So I've developed an eight-week support program where each week you get an email of what worked for me, as well as other tried and true tools to help with grief. It's a beautiful, calming, healing resource that I think you're really going to like and that you can use in your everyday life to find out what works for you and what doesn't. And the great thing is, you find yourself feeling stronger and more in control so you can work out what you want life to look like going forward. So if this sounds like something you would like to check out, head over to my website or check out the link in the episode notes. You're looking for a letter of hope and aroha. Now, for somebody who's listening, who's not aware of inner child work, or shadow work, can you just give us an explanation of what what that's defined as? So I can give you my explanation. How yeah, I that would be perfect. <laughs> I view my inner child as the purest essence of me. So when we get born onto this planet, we are basically right directly from source. We are these lights. It's just you see a baby, and you can just tell. And so we're just these beings of pure potential. That's all human beings really are. It's just constant. We're just energy of pure potential. And we can take that down a dark way, a light way, whatever way we want. Um, but we get born into this world as these beautiful source, potential-filled, energy-filled beings. And when we start to engage in this reality, we get energy. We start to learn things. We get energy put onto us. And so we'll start to adopt in order to fit in, right? Like if your mom wants you to be a certain way, you'll be that way. Or if your dad wants a certain way, or if you start to be disciplined in a certain way, or if you start to get told by certain family members how things are done, you'll, or you go to school even, you, you want to fit in. You want to become a part of your family. So then that energy potential starts to get distorted based on what other people's perspectives are, which is where we can start to close our hearts down. Because if you're someone who has a very open heart and you want, for me, example, I can only use me as an example. When I was a child, I was so open and I was, and everyone was coming to take my light because I was so kind and I was so caring and I was so giving. And that's who I am as a being. I am just this potential of just like, I got to a place the other day on my couch where I was just saying, I am love. And I was born that way. Like I was trying to teach my mom. I would grab her by at two years old by her face. You try to teach her my language and try to teach her love and try to like, it's funny now because I realize that it's a, a mantra that I now say to myself. It's a Kundalini mantra. But so I started to, I remember when I started to do the shadow work, when did I feel my purest self? 
when did like where did this come from? Where did this darkness come from? When did I start to feel so crappy? Because for so long, like my early childhood from age birth to seven and a half, I had the most magical experiences. I could see things. I could talk to things. I could. I felt beautiful. I felt light. I felt these like almost like my hand was being held by the other side, like God was holding my hand. I just felt so in tune and just, I could even remember climbing in a tree and going off and just like becoming a bird and then becoming like an animal, like a little chipmunk and then going over and becoming a, it was like I could become all these things. And so when I was started to do my healing work after my dad passed away, I was like, when did I feel the best? And I was brought back right to when I was a child and I could just feel that beautiful light and I was like it and it was me and so I started to realize that this world hardens you because you are forced a lot of times to fit into boxes you're or especially based on society what society wants you to do societal structures Because not everywhere is a place to become an Arabian health counselor. You know what I mean? Like I had to pick a route based on what school offered. And so we will close ourselves down into these little boxes, which then creates darkness. And it creates us having to do both. But this is a really good point because I was trying to talk about it in when I do my shadow work. So there's two shadows, actually. So there's the one that you want to be. So it's, I want to be a fairy magical person living in the woods, but society tells me that's crazy and weird. But that creates a shadow aspect because in one realm, I'm living and I have to cut that part off of me. So then it actually becomes a shadow. Then there's darkness in which we are given. So if we've been abused, traumatized, had painful experiences, whatever that is, that creates another shadow. That creates a pain darkness. And both of those causes our hearts to shut down. And it's in our hearts that our inner child lives because it's our hearts and our souls because the heart is just the passageway to the soul. And when you're a baby and you're a child, you are so deeply connected to that soul, that source of potential of who you are. That gives blossom to desire in your heart because our heart is what manifests our desires, not our brain. So then that will then that's why children are so imaginative because they have all these desires that they start to fill out because their heart starts communicating and they start to manifest from that purposeful, loving place. But then society starts to tell you, no, you can't do that anymore at a certain point. So then you have to start to create this box and you have to start to limit your heart expansion, which then if something painful happens, you actually start to create walls, their heart walls and their emotional experiences that get trapped in your body, which then limits that that expansion of the heart. So then the it's almost like the light just gets smaller and the hole just gets smaller and smaller for your desires and your heart to to shine forth, which is like what you were talking about, where then the heart shuts down. So then we what I started to realize is I shut my heart down, but when you close your heart down, you stop inviting things in, but things then can't out either. So then you trap your mm-hmm. pain inside of you. And then they create even more pain and more pain and more pain because you're not open to letting things go or opening into new experiences. And then that's where the brain actually starts to go into repetitive thought cycles. Because if you don't allow your heart to experience something new, your brain will go into protective defensive survival mode. And so sometimes even if I started to realize the darkness in which my thoughts were using was just trying to digest the darkness of which I had closed all the pain inside. So in a weird way, I was keeping myself safe by saying to myself, you're in so much pain, do you want me to take you out of this world? And so I started to actually see how this this pain was trapped inside of me based on going through, starting to see how body work, like getting massages, calming the nervous system, like literally creating that safety and that security in my nervous system so I could feel like I could open up. Because if you're in survival mode and you're in an abusive place, you have to get through it. You have to, your brain will shut down. I've act, this is what I learned in my psychology studies. Your brain will shut down to get you to a place of survival. And oftentimes in war-stricken countries 
or in abusive families or whatever it is, you don't even get that opportunity to get out of survival brain because every day there's another trauma. So your brain just is trying to keep you safe over and over. You don't have time to create that safe space or you at least you don't believe you do because sometimes you can even create that safe place. And that's what I started to realize that when I can drop out of my brain and into my heart and actually start to alchemize that darkness, I can turn it into light through gratitude, through just creating that space and saying no and to certain things, setting boundaries, walking away from certain experiences. So to answer, to go back, I started to just ask myself, when was I the most joyful and felt the most free? And that's when I was brought back to my childhood. So then I started to do guided meditations of just seeing myself as a child. And then I started to weep and I started to cry and I started to get all these like chills and these experiences. And then I started doing kundalini yoga, which brings a lot of breath work in and brings a lot of like mudras and chanting and healing. So I would bring and I would have these experiences of reliving painful times in my childhood, some dark times. And that started to help me to see the other shadow of who I really, truly wanted to be. When I would let go of the pain shadow, I would create more space for my truth, which is my desires to start manifesting. And then I started to gain confidence in my adult conscious life to start business, to start doing these things, because that's always something that as a child, I was making my own spells. I was writing books. I was drawing things. I was wanted to be a healer. I was going out grabbing dandelions, creating little like herbal concoctions, like trying to teach my mom my language, like doing, I was like, I was so into magic that at one point my mom wrote me, I loved Harry Potter so much that I, my mom wrote me a letter pretending that I got, I made a mailbox for outside my bedroom. This is you know, so imaginative. And that my mom wrote me a letter and she put it in the mailbox that I got into this wizard master school. And I like came running downstairs screaming like, I'm going, all these things. I started to pack my bag. She let me believe it for about a week. But I kept telling her I'm really going because she didn't think I would take it to this place. But I really believed this. So I was like, that's where my magic is. I was I believed in magic so much that I really thought I was going away to wizard school. Like. No doubt in my mind wow. that I got into wizard school. So I just really was like, okay. So I started to take myself there and I started to do the work and I started to realize that emotions get stuck in my body. Where are they stuck? I started to do self abiyanga, which is an Ayurvedic form of self massage where you apply warm herbal oils to your own body. And I started to realize I never touched my body with love. It's almost looked down upon in this world. So I started to use affirmations and I started to apply the oil and then I, my nervous system started to relax. So then I started to have vivid dreams again. So then I started to be invited back into my childhood where I could start to do guided meditations with my child, my inner child. And I was brought to this space of what's called and where I take a lot of my clients, my heart space garden, where I started to meet and have experiences in my heart with my inner child. And then I started to realize that my brain is up here with thoughts, but there's an actual emotional intelligence in my chest. Like that's how it started. And then I started to realize, okay, this is what I was always in tune with as a child. This is where my source is. This is where my power is because the little bit of light I started to do and bring even more of my pain and the more my heart expanded, the more pain I could And I could withstand. And so then I started to actually heal into that and started to see my desires and what I truly wanted to come for. And then I could start to actually see my pain diminish. And so then I realized this is the center of where alchemy happens. This is where we need to go. This is where the healing takes place. We could talk about it forever. We could be up in our brains and I was forever. But it wasn't until I dropped down into my heart and I started to utilize that wisdom and I started to journal. I started to be honest. I started to work with the moon. I'll be honest with you about that. New moons, full moons. I started to get really real about the people that hurt me. I wrote them letters. I was very open and honest, like F you, blah, 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 blah. Whatever I thought was like stupid little things of like in fifth grade, someone put 
glue on my pants. Like that hurt my feelings at, in, in that time. So I'm not going to pretend that it didn't. So I don't need to go knock down on Jimmy's door and be like, wow, you put glue on me. Let's work this out. I just started to let go of it from my own being, my own nervous system. And then that's when I just became brighter and brighter. And I started to have people start to say, like, you look different. You're acting different. Less triggers. Like, I could actually go home and be around my family. Now my family comes to me for healing. So it's like before they didn't want to be around, not to say they didn't want to be around me. I was hard to be around because I was hard to be around. So when I started to go back to that inner child, she's now become my best friend. And I've created this new voice and this new parent inside myself where I can get through really hard things and I can really show up for myself and I can create boundaries. And anytime a trigger comes up, even though I may not have healed it all the way through, I know what to do. And I don't need to freak out and I don't need to go into a dark space and I don't need to shut down. I can actually create more space and hold myself in that love. And so the inner child work is something that I've been guided here to help people do because I was such an imaginative, magical little child that for so long I thought I was so weird. But turns out I always needed that to help people to become that because we are just pure imagine. Like we are just pure imagination. That's all we are. Everything that we are doing, this microphone I'm talking into was once imagined. You know, me and you were once imagined by our parents. You know what I'm saying? Everything starts as an imaginary thing. And then we put work into bringing it into this physical. And Ayurveda helped me to understand the power of manifestation. And then the loss of my dad brought me back to my childhood. And I started to incorporate all of these things. And then I started to realize that once I dealt with my fear and my pain and I sat with it and I let it shatter me, I let it rock me, I let it, there's an image now, I don't know if anyone's seen this movie, but it's called The Little Buddha and it's with Keanu Reeves and he, it's about him becoming the Buddha and he sits in this scene in the movie where he's about to become the Buddha and he's sitting under the tree and the devil basically, I guess I'll just use that word, comes to him and he starts to the illusion of fear really comes and he starts to shake his tree and like the, there's this fire and this whatever and he just is sitting there with it and he's just I know you're not real that's what inner child work did for me I went back in my I could sit now in a dark space and the darkness can whisper and do all the things and I just know it's not real because I have the power within me to handle whatever darkness comes and darkness has come <laughs> And it just continues to be alchemized by creating that relationship with my inner child, going back, doing the shadow work. And that's what I try to help other people to. That's such an incredible explanation of inner child work. And I love it because I'm hoping that people who are listening are going to really see the value of doing this work. because. These words are out there and, you know, we're surrounded by them in a child work and people go, <laughs> yeah, right, let's get back to our child. And like they kind of mock it, but really what you're talking about is something so, so incredibly powerful and, and, and it's really touching base with who we are authentically. This is how we come back to being our authentic selves. We have to actually work out where that pain originated from, even if it was right from the outset. And, you know, the, the feeling in your body and, and why sometimes people who have undergone so much trauma need to have that body work done before they can even start to make sense of it in their mind. So incredible, incredible work you're doing. Thank you. I really want to talk about your book. Mm -hmm. But just before we do that, can you just explain to us how the work that you are doing has helped you with the tragic loss of your uncle this past Christmas and the effect on the family and how you've been able to help them make sense of that. Yeah. So one thing that I've noticed with the loss of my uncle is it's bringing out, because with any loss, and I'm sure that you're aware of 
addict, and many people listening to this podcast are, it's that loss, then so many other things start to fall apart too. You start to like yes. relationships, you start to realize things, friends that you thought were there aren't there for you, family members that you thought were okay aren't okay. But you just start to see all of this like crumbling and this darkness starts to, there's like a release because that being was encapsulated in a physical body. So both their darkness and their light and then the relationship that you had with them starts to become very apparent. And then it's just, it's so confusing and it's so overwhelming. And then your brain does shut down in a certain way. So you don't even know how to get through your day. So doing the work that I've done, first and foremost, losing my dad helped me to be there for certain people in my family that I knew I needed to be there. For example, my younger cousin. Like I lost my dad at 20. He lost his dad at 19, turning 20. So I was like, I know and I have to put myself in that shoot those shoes so I could show up for him the way that he needed to. And it created that all my inner child work and my shadow work created the emotional capacity for me to not fall apart, to grieve in a healthy way and to be able to show up for people that I needed to show up for, like my mom and my aunt, because I was their brother. And then also my younger cousin and certain other people in my family that needed to fall apart. Because I remember on the phone when my mom told me that he had passed, she's, I'm so sorry. I don't know how to be there for you right now. I, I don't know. how. And I said, for the first time in my life, you don't need to. I'll be there for you. Wow. So that created that capacity for me to be able to do that. And then I started to see now because my uncle was the rock of our family and he kept everyone safe and secure that everyone feels unsafe and unsecure that I was like, okay, now we're doing family shadow work. Now we got to start to deal with our own pain because he was always the one that I got it. I'll take care of it. I'll do this. And I started to see there's already a blessing in this because we all have to now take responsibility in some way or another for ourselves, for our hearts and for what it is that we need to do to come together. So it started to show like family dynamics that we needed to clear up because there's some triggers in there. It started to show just ways in which we need to be more towards the light and to not get caught up in the drama of things, which doing my own shadow work has helped me to be able to hold space and to point some things out to certain people in myself through this in a very loving way. You know what I'm saying? Before it would have come across maybe not so loving. Granted, there are certain people that I had to say, get away from me. But um, I did that also in a loving way. It just really was a testament to, because when you do this work and you're on the spiritual path and you, your ego can always come in and say, I'm healed and I'm good and I got this and I'm perfect. And then you get another, brought to another moment of just pure rawness. And then that's when you have to decide who you really are. And so that's one thing that I decided I am going to be who I said I am to my clients. Because if I tell them to do this inner child work and I tell them to do all these things and then here I go right back to it, no. So it created so much more capacity for me to hold my grief, for me to know now. And I've healed it through it in a very different way because... I'm 30 now versus when I was 20. So I did when I was 20, go out with my friends, try to forget about it. This time I'm taking it on very consciously and I'm going out into the woods and I'm talking to the trees and I'm going out into nature and I'm walking and I'm finding ways to regulate my nervous system. And I'm talking out loud to him, to my uncle, and I'm allowing myself to yell and scream and cry, but in a healthy way, like away from not secluded away from people, but in a way that people don't need to interact with me if I'm in that space. And I'm starting to become softer and kinder and to set boundaries and to let people be more authentic and honest. Like people are like, do you want to go do this or this? And I'm saying, no, I don't have the capacity for that. And then also, for example, I don't know if she'll want me saying this, but my mom just called me having a breakdown today. I was able to listen. I was able to really hold that space and, uh, like I said, allow people in my life who need me to hold that space. I can do it and I not get lost in it, too. So it's been a. There is so much pain and grief, but there is also so much beauty. Like I said, this is why I love that you call it this, because. I've learned more about my lover 
these people that have passed away too, because that's really all it is, is just that love. And sometimes even when you are having the most joyful moment in your life, you cry and it feels almost painful because there's a fine line between that love and that pain. And grief makes you walk that together. It makes that hand in hand. So one minute I'm laughing at how much I loved him. The next minute I'm crying, at, cry laughing, crying at how much the pain was. So it's like this fine line. And it just has helped me to realize that I don't need to do anything other than allow the process and to know that to keep my heart open and that the love is always there and that I can utilize the love for myself to do more self-love and I can be open to that person because they're never truly gone to me, in my opinion. They're always coming through songs some other way. And instead of closing my heart down to they're gone now, woe is me, the drama of it, I start to ask the universe to show me in which where they're going to be next. So that way my heart stays open to them in the ways in which they've given to me in my life so I can continue to grow. Because as long as we're embodied, we're supposed to grow. As long as we're here in this planet, we're supposed to do something. And it doesn't have to be a job yeah. or a career. I'm just saying we're here for something. For a purpose. Sydney, that is so beautiful. Honestly, you're just touching my heart over and over again with what you're saying. You know, I, I get you. I understand what you're saying so, so well. And I, I guess what scares a lot of people when they have such a big loss in their lives is that they don't realize that with that loss, with that grief of losing that very treasured person from their life is that Pandora's box flies open, the lid flies open and everything else in their life seems to come up to the surface. So they're not just dealing with that specific loss of their loved one. They are having to face everything else. And, you know, once you realize that this is so much bigger, <laughs> this is your life story you're dealing with, then it is an opportunity to then sort of say, okay, need some strategies here and uh, what's going to work. So, so grateful you're bringing all of this up and out into the open so people can understand. You've written a book, yes. Cleanse Your Energy book. Mm -hmm. Tell us what that's about. And there's a journal that goes with it as well. Yep. So basically, Cleanse Your Energy is just a very practical guide. It's a short little book that includes seven ways for you to get in tune with your energy, to understand how energy gets stored in your body, emotions get stored in your body, and how there is an actual way to utilize self-care to start to shift and change your nervous system and to change the energy in which you're holding, kind of what I was explaining about with the inner child work. So there are certain things like if you go into a tub of cold water, you're going to become cold because that's the energy that's you're saturated in that coldness. And so you're going to be shivering and everything's going to seem like it's cold. And then if you go into a hot tub, now you're hot. That's the energy in which you're swimming in. So everything's going to seem hot and everything's going to be like have a different perspective from based on different energies. And so based on experiences that we have, we saturate ourselves with specific energies, especially if we come from a certain type of family, if we come from painful past experiences, if we've been told something over and over. And there's different levels of energy on this planet. Like if you walk into a dive bar, right? You're going to tell that there's a different energy. There's going to be a certain type of person in that place and it's going to attract a certain level of experiences versus if you go to the high-end hotel bar, there's going to be a different type of energy, a different type of ambience, a different type of person will be attracted to that. So basically, I just trying to help people to realize that your energy, you do have control over it and that you can cleanse it and you can choose in which what energy you're going to hold in your body. And Ayurveda really helped me to see this based on the elements and what like attracts like. If I'm angry, grumpy, and upset, who am I going to want to be around? Angry, grumpy, and upset people. If I'm feeling joyful and lighter and wanting to go and travel the world, I'm going to want to be around people who are joyful, lighter, and want to travel the world. So you can start to just notice this in yourself, of which if every day you wake up and you have this heaviness, 
or this depression that you you need to cleanse your energy because some of that is going to be built up past experiences, built up past pain, whatever it is. And so I didn't want to create a book that's super woo woo where people are like, that's not for me because cleansing your energy is literally for everyone because you are an energetic being. If you break down your cells and science is showing us this more and more, we are just pure potential. Our atoms are just pure empty space of potential. And that is energy. And certain energies, like I said, get stuck and we need to know how to move them out. So if you don't want to necessarily go and pay thousands and thousands of dollars to someone to cleanse your energy, you can start in small ways. Home, which is what I did, which is taking cleansing baths, using certain herbs, such as like sage is one of them, Palo Santo, like using. That's something that I also realized, too. We are sacred beings and our sacredness have been taken away from us in so many ways. Well, we make fun of like rituals like that when there's actually like a sacredness to us that we've forgotten our rituals. And then we don't recognize that spiritual relationship that we have with our own self, which is just energy. It's not like a, it's a very practical, I try to lay it all out. I also talk about breath and how we're always breathing things in through our senses. You walk into an environment and something smells bad, you start to feel gross and and you want to get out of there. And then if you go somewhere and something smells good, you want to be there. That's an energy that will influence our mood and that will influence our things. And sometimes we'll trap certain things in our body. Without giving away all of the ways, I put seven ways in there. There's meditation. I do talk about the power of intention. Intention is very important when cleansing your energy. I talk about how trauma and pain can get built up into your body. And then I talk about gratitude, put that a lot in there too. So it's just very easy, very straightforward, simple. And then I have an accompanying journal to take you more into doing the inner child shadow work. So that's a 21-day journal, has affirmations in it. It has a release page where every day you get to release from your day of a painful experience, past. If you got cut off in traffic, write it down. I was angry. It gives you a place to release, which I I did the journal myself. And that was so helpful because if we don't know we can get things out, we'll trap in in our bodies. And then that actually causes stagnation in our energy and closes our heart. And then we create thoughts based on our closed heart about certain things. And then we'll continue to attract those things and then get stuck into this dark cycle. So I do a release page. Then there's just like a guidance page, like a question to take you into a deeper place, whether it's that childhood or even how to set self-care practices. Like I really just ask some deep questions that you can like really open into to get to know yourself again. And then there's gratitude. So then you also you start with releasing, you start with investigating, and then you tie it all together with gratitude. And then that's every day for 21 days. And then 21 days creates a habit. And by the end of the 21 days, you should have a new level of energy in which you can build upon and attract from. And then you'll start to realize, okay, my life is a little bit more in my control. I do have a say in how I show up and who shows up and how I set boundaries. And I, on any point, I can cleanse this experience so I don't have to carry it and hold it forever. Oh, beautiful. And you also have a quiz in there, don't you, that people can work out Mm -hmm. where they're at with their energy on the scale. So that's really, really super helpful. I love those. I love that you've combined the journal with it too, so that people can just take it to that next step if they're ready to do that. That is so great. Hey, we're going to finish up. We've just had such a powerful conversation. I am so grateful to you and your experiences and your wisdom and your knowledge. It's just been truly a blessing to have you talk about all of these things. So let's finish up with what is the best thing that has happened to you so far today? The best thing that has happened to me so far today would be being able to have the emotional capacity in the space to hold for my mom as she was grieving today. That shows me my growth and shows me with the level of safety in which she now has with me when before in the past, even 10 years ago, she wouldn't even feel comfortable sharing that way. That was probably the best thing that's happened. So that's actually transformed your relationship and in a beautiful way. So rather than her being the mother and having that mother role 
you could be great friends now, sharing and supporting each other. That's beautiful. I love that. What is something that you are most grateful for? I am most grateful for my awakening to self. Mm -hmm. Because in my journey back to my heart, because if it were not for that, I wouldn't be able to have so many more positive experiences or have the clients that I have or have the business that I have or have the deep connection that I've created with my mom and my aunt or even started my podcast. So everything has come from that journey of having the courage to go to my heart. Oh, you're making me tear up again, honestly. Done that several times when you've been talking. I've just felt my eyes just going, oh my gosh, so in tune with what you're saying. So what's your go-to when you have moments in your day that are not going so well? And we have an expression here, when they turn to custard. What is What do you do to pivot yourself out of those moments? So I think physically, if I feel really overwhelmed, I'll go into the woods and I'll go for a walk. And I'll start to commune with nature. But in moments where that's not possible, where I don't have a lot of time to spend, I surrender. So I give a moment to just say, I don't understand why this is happening, but I know that you do. And I really have a a really big relationship with God in my life. And it's not the God that maybe everyone has. It's my own internal God and my own relationship with the universe. But I do believe that something is guiding me and keeping me protected. And so I say, little me can't handle it. So I'm handing it over to you. And sometimes literally the sun will get brighter and shine on me or something like a bird will fly by or something like that. And I just surrender. That's so wonderful because we don't often realize what a huge team we have backing us. Like we think sometimes we're all alone, but we're never alone. We just need to do exactly what you've said, reach out and ask and not always understand, but just surrender to it and just say, hey, take this over. It's too much for me in this moment or I don't get it. But you know, like the difference when you chat is like, I do that in my life all the time now. And like things just don't upset me anymore. Like even when I was going away for the weekend, my car wouldn't go past 60 and I just went, okay. So I did a U-turn, went to the mechanic and there was a guy there that could have a look at it and he got it fixed. He put it on the computer and blew out or burnt out one of the filters and I was up on my trip again. Oh my gosh, now if I got really upset and why is this happening and all that, that would have been a completely different outcome. Yep. But I got everything I needed. And yeah, that's how it works, isn't it? Uh-huh. Ah. So uh, any any parting messages you would like to leave with our listeners? I mean, you've already provided so much, <laughs> but I'm, maybe there's something else you just want to leave our listeners with. I really just want to encourage people to have faith and trust in their hearts and to not be afraid to go to that space because it's in that space that I am always reborn and I always get what I need. And yeah, there's feeling there, but that's what we are. We are big, huge feelers as human beings. And so I guarantee that if you take that journey into your heart space, you will not regret it and you will feel more empowered and you will feel more authentic. And so just having the courage to walk through that shadow, that valley of shadow, whatever that that prayer is, yep. that always comes up, you will be met with light. And so that's what I would leave as my last little piece of wisdom is to go into your heart. There's so many beautiful gifts there waiting for you. Ah. Sydney, you are so beautiful. I love that. Thank you. I just want to thank you so much for being so open with us about your incredible journey with your dad and how you've grown from that. And even with Ian and losing your uncle tragically just recently and the beauty come from, from that, you know, throughout your whole journey, the inner child work, the shadow work. All of so, so valuable. 
to understand. And I'm grateful for you sharing that with us today. And I wish you all the very, very best with your business, Inner Element Wellness. We're going to have all the links in the episode notes. So if anybody wants to go and find you, they can just link to there. We'll also have the links to your book and that journal as well. And uh, your website where you have that five-day mini gratitude course that people can go and check out as well. Yeah. So Sydney, you rock, girlfriend. Thank yeah. you so very, very much. And thank you. I just want to say for having me on here, it's part of my healing. So I'm just very grateful for this space that you've created. And you're just a lovely, lovely, lovely human being. And I'm so grateful that you are also being willing to go into your heart and to do this work. And it's going to make a big difference in so many people's lives. So seriously, thank you for this. Thanks for listening. I hope you got some real value from this episode. If there's a topic you'd like covered, click on the beautiful side of grief at gmail.com link or go into the beautiful side of grief.com website where you can also leave a review. To get notified of new episodes, hit the subscribe button. And if you know of somebody who could benefit from this episode, please share, share, share. And until next time, please be kind to you and take good care.